Welcome back. So in the last few videos, we have seen how to use graphs for designing or modeling problems and how that can be useful for solving many of the problems. In this video, we will be looking at graphs as a subject itself. Now graph theory is a big subject in itself. It would usually take one whole course to study graph theory at least even for the elementary purposes. So in one video I cannot do a good justice on graph theory but I would like to go over some of the properties of graphs that can be useful for understanding how to attack graph problems. Also we have already seen some of the examples of how to use graphs for modeling problems. We will be continuing to see more such examples in this video and in the next video. So to quickly recap, what is graph? So it's a set of vertices and a set of edges. Edges are basically pairs of vertices. And the graph is given by v comma e but v is the set of vertices and e is the set of edges. Now these are some of the definitions I have always shown whenever I talked about graphs. Namely if the edges that represent some kind of a binary relation is symmetry that means uv is in the edge if and only if u is in the edge then the graph is called undirected. And sometimes for our purposes we might add a weight to the edges. Also if there is an edge from u to v, we say v is a neighbor of u. And the number of neighbors of v is known as the degree of v. So pictorially we have this set of vertices and these edges to give the undirected graph. We can have weights on the edges to have weighted undirected graphs and we can have directions on these edges to get weighted directed graphs. We have seen the use of undirected graph as well as directed graph. We haven't seen the use of weighted graphs yet but as you can imagine weighted graphs can also be useful for modeling various problems. Now, <clears throat> the main advantage of graphs is that they are very simple and yet pretty general and they can be used to design or model lots and lots of real life problems. And hence studying graph structures is an important field by itself. In this video, I will be going through some of the properties of graphs and try to convince you that those properties are correct. I will not be giving very formal proofs in any of those cases. I, I would really recommend you guys to take a full course on graph theory which will be much more useful, much useful for understanding the, the graph theory aspects. In the next video and the next other next couple of videos, we will be showing about how to model other problems using not, not only just graph theory but other property, other mathematical objects. And you will slowly try to you slowly try to start to realize the importance of this object of graphs. So there are a number of properties and structures in the graph that arise again and again and we need to study them by themselves. So the idea is that the theory should be there so that whenever we convert the problem to graph we can use properties from the theory to answer the problems. Right? So to start with we looked at the concept of paths. So a path from u to v is basically a sequence of edges that start from a vertex 
a sequence of vertices that starts from u and end at v so that any consecutive vertex has an edge between them so in other words if i have this is the graph and i do want to draw a path from g to a g f d a is a path so is g e c b d a is a path now if the graph is directed then we have to talk about a directed path so if this is the direction on the edges then this g e c b d a is unfortunately not a directed path because the edge between b and d is in the wrong direction so this is not a directed path but something like g e c b a is a directed path from g to a <clears throat> now if there is a path from u to v we say u is connected to v in an undirected graph if for any two vertex u and v it is connected then we say the graph is connected and as you can see since in an undirected graph there is no direction if there is a path from u to v there is a path from v to u also now here is the first problem that we had asked you to think about namely this relation u to u is connected to v is an equivalent relation now let's try to prove this particular case so if this is the graph g first of all to prove that it is equivalent relation we have to call three things namely it is symmetric reflexive and transitive now first of all it is reflexive why because u is related to u so u is connected to u because you start from u you are always in u so there is a path from going from u to u so this back was it true that u is connected to u so i have to prove reflexive symmetric and transitive now reflexive is easy what about symmetric now if there is a path from u to v now by the way this one i had pointed out last time also here we mean that the graph is undirected the graph is undirected so there is a path from u to v right so if this one is as we have denoted v1 v0 v1 v2 v3 till vk now note that we can also have a path from v to u by then renaming this one as v0 the next one as v1 till this one as vk so u is connected to v that means v is connected to u so it's kind of easy to see that they are symmetric so symmetric case also true now what about the transitive case so the transitive case the idea is that if u is connected to v and v is connected to w so it may be that w v is connected to w through this path and this is w so there is a path from u to v there is a path from v to w it may be that some of the edges are u some of the vertices are u now question is that is there a path from u to w and the question answer is that yes it is for example i can therefore then traverse from go from u to to w by going to u to v from and then retracing back the path and going back to w so if there is a path from u to w uh, u to v and there is a path from v to w then there is a path from u to w also hence in the case of undirected graph it is equivalent relation now why did we use the undirectedness no the undirectedness was specially used for the symmetric case 
if it is not undirected then the relationship is not symmetric okay so that means if the graph is undirected then the relation namely u is connected to v is an equivalent relation and when we have an equivalent relation as we have pointed out then earlier then the whole set of set on which the equivalence the relationship is told namely the set of vertices here we can split up split them up into we can split them up into equivalent partitions right so namely we can therefore split up the graph g into chunks like this where any two vertex here is related any two vertex here all the vertices are related and a vertex from this point to this point is not related so <clears throat> so we have the equivalent classes these are the equivalent classes and what it means is that these are all connected graphs somehow means you can go from any vertex to any vertex but you cannot go from one connected component to the other these are called the connected component so thus if the graph is undirected then the whole graph can be split up into connected components where individual components are connected and across components there is no way one can go from the other one to the other note that this is this heavily uses the fact that the relationship is equivalent and in fact if the relationship is not equivalent then we could not have got it and hence if the graph g was not undirected but was directed then we could not have got this particular property so we have this so an undirected graph we can split up into connected components and the graph is a disjoint union of the connected components this is both the case of undirected graph now moving on there is a concept of cycles which is basically a path that starts and ends at the same place so for example this is a cycle g f d p e is a cycle so is this one d a b c b d a b e is a cycle and we can also have directed cycles for example this is not a directed cycle but this is a directed cycle right so cycles are very useful concepts in graph theory and here is one of the nice problems that we have that if g is an undirected graph such that every vertex has degree greater than 2 greater than or equal to 2 then g has a cycle what does it mean by every vertex have degree greater than or equal to 2 meaning every vertex have two neighbors so let's see how to prove this statement so if this is a graph what we can do is that we can start from a vertex and keep on walking on the edges right now if i keep on walking on the edges because the every vertex have degree 2 greater than 2 that is whatever vertex i whatever edge i enter from i will try not to go out from that same edge so i enter a vertex from a edge and leave a vertex from a, a different edge because of the degree 2 case every vertex has two uh, edges going in uh, one two edges at the same point so what i do is i start from a vertex and keep on walking i enter a vertex from a deep, from an edge and leave the vertex to the other edge so if i cannot keep on going about it infinitely right because the graph is finite so at some point of time i must end up coming back to one of the vertices i have already visited and once i have that i get a cycle this is a cycle 
right? So let's try to prove it again by looking at a graph which does not have a cycle. Say for example, this graph does not have a cycle. Now, here, thing is that if I start walking from here, I could have been here, then go here, then go here. But now I have to retrace back my, my back my back my path on the same path, which is unfortunately what I don't want to go. Right? So it is very important that we whatever age we enter from, we don't go out from the same path in this cycle. By doing so, we can ensure that that we always, if I end up revisiting the revisiting a vertex second time, we actually get a cycle. Okay, so this is a very simple, quick observation. And that's a very powerful observation, as we will see very shortly, what does this particular observation mean? That if a graph, for a graph, if every vertex has degree greater than or equal to 2, then the graph has a cycle. Note that we can have a graph like this, which in which case, as you can see, every vertex except for the first and the last has degree equal to 2 and yet it does not have a cycle. So, on, so we always require that every vertex has degree greater than equal to 2. We require that. Right? <coughs> now we have the concept of trees. So what is a tree? First of all, a graph that does not have a cycle, an undirected graph that does not have a cycle is called an acyclic graph. And if that acyclic graph is connected, then we call it a tree. Now why is it a tree called? So it's basically because if you draw a graph of this form, it is usually like this. So this is a typical representation of a graph that does not have a cycle. Okay. So as you can see, it looks like a tree. And therefore, it is called a tree. Sometimes it is drawn in the opposite direction. So it is drawn like this. So if this is a graph, for example, then we can have a, this is a tree. A tree where the, is a connected graph, the red edges gives you a connected graph and there is no cycle. So it's a tree. Similarly, this is also a tree. Right? There can be various kind of trees. So the definition of the tree if a connected undirected graph that has that does not have a cycle is called a tree. Now here is a equivalent definition of a tree, namely a tree is minimally connected graph. Now what does it mean by minimally connected? So graph is minimally connected if I can remove, for example, that this is a graph, and I say that this is not a minimally connected graph. Why? Because I can remove this edge and still the graph can be connected. So graph is minimally connected if I cannot remove any edge. And yet, uh, if rather, if I remove any edge, then the graph becomes disconnected. A graph is minimally connected. Now the thing is that if a graph has a If a graph has a cycle, then the graph cannot be minimally connected. So if this is a graph and there is a cycle sitting here, 
and I don't care how things are there otherwise, but in this cycle, I can take any of the aid and remove that, and yet the graph will be remain connected. So this is not a minimally connected graph because I could remove an edge and still the graph could remain connected. Right? So as you can see, I just now proved to you that if a graph has a cycle, then the graph is minimally, it can, is not minimally connected. Now how do I prove the opposite direction? If a graph is not minimally connected, it must have a cycle. Okay, I leave it to you guys to think about. But basic idea is that, the most important thing is that a tree has two or three different definitions, all of them are equivalent. This is one of them, that this is a connected graph that doesn't have a cycle. And second one is this one. A tree is the minimally connected graph, meaning given a graph, a graph is minimally connected if by removing any edge you can make it disconnected. If it is not that case then it is called minimally connected. Now here is one very important property of graphs, a graph, I'm sorry, a tree, a tree has a degree 1 vertex. Now can you, someone see how to prove this statement? We prove it by contradiction. So if this is not the case, that means what? That means all vertex, all vertex has degree greater than or equal to 2. And if that is the case, then we just now proved some couple of slides ago that it means that the graph G, the graph has a cycle, which means that graph is not a tree by the definition. So a tree must have a degree one vertex, at least one degree one vertex. If it doesn't have any degree 1 vertex, then it must have a cycle and in that case, we contradict the definition of a tree. So once we have such a vertex, we call that vertex a leaf. Now how does this leaf look like? Let's say I have the graph G, this is a tree, right? This is a tree and I know that there is a vertex like this, a vertex of degree 1. Now what does it mean? That means this tree has lots of other things like this. Now what happens if I remove this this vertex. Will the graph remain connected? If I remove this vertex as well as this edge. The fact is that yes, it will remain connected. Why? Because any A, any path from say U to V cannot use this vertex because it must be going via path without using this vertex. So if I remove this A, no pair of vertex is disturbed. The only pair of vertex that gets disturbed is the path from this particular vertex to any other vertex. But given the fact that I have destroyed this particular vertex, so the rest of the graph is still connected. So I get the following that if you remove the leaf from a tree, the tree still remains connected. So here note that I am not just removing the edge from the leaf to the rest of the tree, but the leaf itself. So I get a graph on a smaller number of vertices, right? So for example, if this is a tree, and 
and if I remove this edge and this vertex then I get this graph is the graph on one less number of vertices but still it is a tree and still it is connected right this is an if you important note uh, observation that if you remove a leaf from a tree then the rest of the graph is still connected now can you answer this question how many edges are there in a graph on n vertices now to answer this one let me say that okay let me first give you the answer the answer is n minus 1 and how to prove it now the proving is can be done by induction so here was a tree and here was a leaf a tree house which has a leaf right so this is a graph on smaller so this is a tree on t n minus 1 and this whole thing is a tree on n node vert vertices so how many edges are there in this tree on n minus 1 node the number of edges is on this set is by induction hypothesis is n minus 2 and how many edges are there in tn so this is number of edges in tn minus 1 right number of edges in tn minus 1 plus this edge plus 1 which is tn n minus 2 plus n minus plus 1 is n minus 1 so basically by using induction one can prove induction and all the other properties that we have used so what are properties we have used we have used the property that a tree has a leaf okay or a degree one vertex and we have also used that if you remove the leaf from the tree you get a tree on a smaller number of edges uh, vertices right and then we apply the induction hypothesis on this particular case to get the answer that the number of edges in a tree on n vertices is n minus 1. Now I would request you guys to go and uh, solve this particular induction completely for yourselves. In this course, it will be hard for me to judge whether you have understood the induction high, um, techniques, how, how well you have understood the induction techniques, particularly because the quizzes and assignments are all multiple choice questions, which are, which are not the most perfect way of judging the understanding of topics like induction hypothesis. But this is a good example how many edges are there on, in a tree on n vertices a good example where you have to do induction on graphs this is a very important concept we have done induction on graphs earlier also particularly in the case of the tournament problem and so on but this is something very useful and very crucial for your understanding of graph theory and induction <coughs> right Okay, now moving on, other than trees, we also, okay, there was this concept of spanning tree. Now, what, so given a graph, if I take, if we remove some of the edges and some of the vertices, then whatever we get, we call it a subgraph. Now, given a graph G, a tree that is a subgraph of G and touches every vertex is called a spanning tree. Now the question is that every graph has a spanning tree as a subgraph. Now this follows from the fact that if this graph is not already a tree, so first of all if the graph is already a tree and the graph is connected, 
then the graph itself is a spanning tree. If the graph is not a tree and is connected, so that means it is not minimally connected. In that case, there must be a cycle or an edge that I can remove. So I remove that edge, I get a smaller graph which is connected and we recurse on that again. So using this recursive idea, we do get the fact that every graph has a spanning tree as a subgraph. Now other than the trees and paths, we also looked at things like independent set and click. Now these are two uh, very important concepts again. An independent set is a set of vertices such that no two vertex in this set has an edge between them. And a click is a set of vertices such that there is an edge between any pair of vertices in the set. So for example, if this is an independent, if this is a graph, the independent set is this one, the A and E, because there is no edge between them. Or D, C and G forms another independent set. On the other hand, say C, F and G is a click of size 3. Similarly, we can have A, D and B is a click of size 3 again. Now finding the largest independent set or the largest click in a graph is a pretty complicated or a hard problem, a well, very challenging problem, very well studied problem also. So we have seen the application of application of uh, independent set. I am going to skip this case. Let me go on to a different concept namely the coloring. So given a graph G, a coloring is basically coloring a set of vertices using colors namely there is a mapping from the vertex set to 1 to k such that no two consecutive edge in a vertex has the same color. That means if there is an edge between vi and vj, then color of vi is not equal to color of vj. The typical question is that can one color a graph with k colors? Right? So in this case, yeah, the minimum number of colors required to color a graph is called the chromatic number of a graph. So for example here, if this is the graph, if A is colored red, B, has, B is colored blue, C can be colored red again, D because it's adjacent to both red and blue can be colored green, E because it is adjacent to all red, blue and green, it has to be colored yellow and F can be colored red and G can be colored green and here we have a coloring with four colors. Now can you color this graph with less than that, namely can you color this graph with three colors? This is the kind of question that usually is asked and we have seen that the application of coloring can be seen in the coloring of uh, maps. So for example, here is coloring of the states of India using colors so that no two adjacent state has the same color. And as you can see it has it uses four colors. Now let me just tell you here, I cannot prove it that every map can be colored with four colors. So every map can be colored with four colors. This is called the four coloring theorem and a very beautiful theorem. Unfortunately, it is beyond the scope of this uh, course to tell you the, the proof of this theorem.
but I encourage you to go and take a look at it in some other place, maybe online or something. Then you will find the four coloring theorem. Now here is one very nice thing. So if every vertex of a graph has degree less than D, then the graph is decolorable, meaning the graph can be colored using D colors. Now why is it so? Again, the way to prove it is by induction. To take a graph G where every vertex has degree less than or less than D. Take a vertex V and let's consider G minus V, right? Now this is G minus V. Now G minus V is again a graph where the degree of every vertex is less than D because if you remove a vertex, the degree cannot go up. So without loss of generality or rather by inductive hypothesis, I can assume that there exists a decoloring of this graph. There exists a decoloring. Now consider V. Question is that what do you color V? Now V has how many neighbors? It has less than D. That means at most D minus 1 neighbors. So that means there must be D minus 1 colors that the neighbors have. So if I have any D, any of the D colors, one of the colors must be missing from the neighbors. I can use it to color vertex V, right? And hence I get a D coloring of this whole graph. So if all the vertex of a graph has less than D colors, then the graph is D colored. Right? So this is a very, again, a nice property that would come in handy many times. And using this one, actually, you can prove that a map is, can be colored using four colors. A map can be colored using four colors. Sorry, not four, five colors. Four color is slightly hard, but five color is easy. So you can get this proof using this particular theorem that I have proved. I leave it to you guys to go and check the proof of this whole thing. Now, one more problem on coloring. So if alpha g is the set of independent set and the sky g is the chromatic number, meaning number of number of colors required to color the graph, then prove that the product of them is greater than the size of the graph on the size of V. Now why is it so? Let me quickly, it basically follows from again the uh, definitions. So if I have a coloring of this graph say, so this one I can color red, this one I can color blue, Maybe this one also I can color blue, this one I can color red, this one I can color blue, this one I can color black, so you can, we have made a mistake here, this is not the best coloring, the best coloring to do is be this one colored blue, this be colored black, then this can be colored black, and this can be colored red. Now note that if you look at the red colors, the vertex colored red, then they don't have an edge between them. This is by definition, right? That no two red colored vertex can have an edge between them. Because no two vertex 
which are adjacent have the same color. So that means the red colors is an independent set. Similarly, as you can see, the blue colors will also give you an another independent set. And similarly, the black colors will also give you an independent set. So, and by definition of this is the maximum independent set, that means the number of color, number of vertices colored red is less than alpha g. The number of vertices colored blue is also less than alpha g. Number of vertices colored black is also less than alpha g. So the number of vertices colored is less than the number of colors times alpha g. So namely number of vertex therefore we have the size alpha g times chromatic number is greater than or equal to the number of vertices. So here is another problem or property of graphs that can be solved not using induction but just by plain definition on plain definition. Okay, so what we have till now, we have the fact that graphs are very useful for modeling various problems. The graphs are studied by themselves in a subject called graph theory. We have studied some of the properties of graphs and most of the properties can be deduced using the similar proof techniques namely induction, contradiction, case studies, etc. Now this is clearly not the end of graph theory. Graph theory is a huge subject in itself and we will not be able to spend too much time on graph theory. But I hope that I have, you have understood the importance of graphs and how that can be useful for modeling real life problems. In the next few videos, I will be talking about modeling in general, taking a problem and modeling into modeling it into some other mathematical things. Particularly, I'll be looking at something called a linear programming and graph theory and see how problems in real life can be modeled in linear programming and graph theory. Thank you.